And as people pop in, we can, uh, I'll just let them in. So, so what we're going to be doing this morning is a class that we like to do with uh, not just new agents, but all agents. And it's how to keep a home inspection from killing the deal. Um, this is, we're not doing the CE here, but we're going to be doing as a, uh, just a complimentary, call it that. So what we're gonna be going over today is learning how to manage the client's emotions during this, the inspection, uh, talk about preparing the house for the inspection and the buyers as well. We're going to do a little report review and discuss some of the criteria to think about when selecting or helping your client select the right inspector and the right inspection company. And then remembering to keep the process positive uh, because there's a lot of information that comes towards clients at the time of uh, purchasing a home. And we need to remember that we're all the cheerleaders here trying to keep them uh, focused on the prize, which is making it to the closing table, right? So let's just get right into it. Some of the stresses for sellers through the process and what's going through their minds. Well, um, they're pretty excited. I got a contract on the house here in Austin. It's going above their uh, asking price. And they have to pack up and move, get the kids into new schools. They probably have a, a contingency on a on a newer con uh, on a newer home, and of course now here comes the contract assassin coming in to ruin it all. Those pesky inspectors they just want to point out everything that's wrong with the house and just ruin the whole deal. Well, let's make sure that the sellers understand that the inspector is just doing their job. They're going to be objective and they're not trying to make it difficult for anyone. Uh, and that if they were buying the house, they would want the same service performed for them. So some of the things that stress buyers, well, everybody's inherently skeptical. skeptical. Um, are they really getting a good deal? Is the house gonna fall apart? Oops, I'm sorry, let me go back here. Um, are there hidden secrets? Is the house safe? That's what everybody's really concerned with. You know, make sure we're not going to have any large repairs. Um, we really like the house, but are we going to have a long list of repairs when we get in there? Well, things that really freak out a buyer, safety items, first and foremost. Maintenance items, too many. Well, uh, we have uh, too much rot on the exterior and uh, too many fixtures to replace. Um, there's going to be the question of who's going to pay for all of this. Are there termites? Is there mold, or lead paint, asbestos, radon? Of course, we don't have to worry about radon here. Um, I don't have everybody unmuted. Typically, we kind of discuss this. Everybody know what radon is? No? Okay, let me tell you. Radon is a gas that forms or collects in a house, and it is from the decay of uranium in the soil. So we don't have a prevalence of that here in Central Texas, and in Texas for that matter. I think maybe they've gotten two or three hits um, in Northeast Texas, maybe you know one or two over the last 20 years somewhere out near the uh, uh, the granite quarries. But uh, mold, everybody's concerned about mold and lead paint and asbestos. So those can be concerns on older houses. Is the sewer going to back up? Are there plumbing leaks? And here's, you know, some people can be kind of catty sometimes. I was insulted and I'm just not going to let them buy the house now. So getting the house ready for the inspection. Well, attic entries, we want to remove all the items obstructing the openings. Uh, that can be cars, uh, items in the garage from staging the house. Electric panels, well, inspectors need to be able to look at the interior of the panels, not just opening the, uh, the door. They actually have to take the front off and look inside, check the condition of the wires. And if there are any shelf units or workbenches or anything of that nature obstructing our access into that, 
it makes it a little, little difficult to get into those. Pathways to the HVAC units and water heaters. Well, we definitely want to check those systems. HVAC is everybody's favorite system inside the house, here in Texas at least. GFCI outlets. Well, they need to be visible, reachable, and we need to be able to reset them after tripping. That gets to be a problem if we have a lot of um, stored items in the garage and a lot of older homes have that GFCI for the, uh, the garage uh, protecting the bathrooms and the exterior. So if we can't get to it, uh, we're probably not going to trip it. And if we do, there's a good chance that there's a freezer with, uh, we're in Texas, so there may be some deer meat <laughs> inside that freezer that could be affected. Uh, removing excess clutter under the sinks that can cause uh, obstructions to the plumbing. We need to be able to see if there's any leaks underneath the, the uh, sinks. Have your sellers replace all the burned out light bulbs. If it's a vacant home, activate all the utilities. We have a large occurrence of vacant homes having the gas turned off for whatever reason. It's always the gas. So we show up for an inspection and the first thing that we see is there is a utility or a uh, uh, a Texas gas utility lock on that meter and we can't operate anything that would be gas related, furnace, water heater, uh, the range, the oven. And be sure that all the pilot lights are lit and remove the pets and the owners if possible. Owners can be a little um, <laughs> pesty at times sometimes. Uh, we do have very well, we have a lot of times had to deal with clients, or uh, they're not our clients, but the sellers who want to follow us around and ask about what we're finding and how they repair it and what we're looking at. And we usually get them to uh, rethink their follow along once we ask them to go get their seller's disclosure, because if we're going to tell them all this information, legally, they need to put it in there. And at that point, they usually disappear for a, a cup of coffee or a beer, depending on the time of day. So listing agents, if you're a listing agent, you can help this process by preparing the house for the inspection. Let's go over a, a couple of things here. Well, if we look up top here on the left-hand photo, we see all these clothes in a closet. And right up above there, what do we see? We see the attic hatch. Okay, well, this shelf right here makes it a little difficult to get in there in the first place. Secondly, what's going to happen when we push up on that attic hatch there? That hatch is more than likely going to have a lot of old insulation on top of it that's going to come pouring out onto all those clothes when we push it up. Um, we try to make the house uh, as close to the condition as we found it when we leave. So we may be pulling some clothes off of there to try and get access. And the last thing that we want people thinking is that we actually went rummaging through their clothes or their items. So if they could remove those items right there themselves before we get there, that would be great. Over here on the right hand, we can see that there's an electrical panel right here against the wall. Remember, I said that we need to take these screws off right here and actually get inside the panel. And if we have this big Nautilus machine right in front there, uh, those things can weigh anywhere between 250 to 450 pounds. Now, we're all, you know, young, strapping, uh, strong gentlemen here, but even I would uh, hold the line here, draw the line at uh, moving this right here and ask that the seller move that themselves so we can safely get access into this panel. Uh, maybe removing some of the dirty clothes, give a little bit of a, a cleanup before we get in there. We want to be able to look at uh, all the areas, as many areas as possible, cleaning up a couple toys, that would be helpful as well. And then there's this. So even sometimes we walk in and go, man, what were they thinking? Okay, well, well let's dissect this photo here. Um, I'll tell you some of the things that would be missing. Number one, over here on this wall is where the GFCI was. It was very difficult to locate. That GFCI was protecting the exterior outlets. 
the garage outlets and also the bathroom outlets. And a little bit further over here was one of those refrigerators that was uh, attached to the GFCI. And of course, um, we want to do our best to find those devices and reset them if we trip them. And if they happen to have, um, you know, lobster tail and Chateaubriand and the uh, uh, refrigerators, as is always seems to be the case when we have these claims, um, we're on the, we could be on the hook for replacing that. Right here, this little red lens looking thing, that's actually the corner of a car. That's the back end of a, a trunk. And right above it was the attic access. So we could not safely pull down that attic access without damaging this car. So what would we want to see up in the attic? Well, are there leaks? What's the condition of the attic, the trusses or the uh, joists and the rafters? How much insulation is up there? And in this particular house, guess what appliances were up there? The water heater and the HVAC system. So this house had a, uh, a callback for uh, a re-inspection. Other things that we would have missed, well, there's a wall right over here on this side that had grade or soil that was too high up the wall and actually came up and was starting to rot some of the wood siding. And there could be termite issues that we wouldn't be able to see on the inside here. We would just have to call out what we see on the exterior. The uh, other thing, foundation condition. We can't see the condition or cracks or uplifting or upheaval or concave features of the garage here as well. So I get it. We want our sellers to be staging the home and getting all the clutter out of the house. It almost always goes into the garage. So if we can have uh, some order to the chaos right here, at least some pathways to some of the uh, features that we need to get to, that could help things go a lot more smoothly. Lastly, the thing that uh, was missed in this house as well, over here behind this uh, card table was where the sub panel was. So we couldn't even get in there. Okay, so when buyers see things like this, their imagination runs wild, right? What are they thinking? They knew we were coming. Do they even wanna sell this house? Uh, then their imagination really starts running wild. You know, this house is gonna catch on fire. It's gonna leak right after we get into the house. So of course they always assume the worst. So we want to avoid them thinking that this house is the money pit. Now on to the inspection preparing the buyers for the inspection. Well, we wanna to explain to them that we're, we as the inspectors are looking for major items. We're not looking for a laundry list of every single detailed maintenance item um, that the house has. We're looking for what I call the big five, foundation, roof, electrical, HVAC, and plumbing. It's pretty obvious if there's some siding that needs to be replaced on the exterior, uh, we could use comments like there are areas or general areas or areas of the, uh, the front and sides that have evidence of rot. Um, but what we're more concerned with is how is the fun foundation functioning? What's the condition of the roof? Do we have any safety issues with the um, electrical? How is the HVAC functioning? These are the bigger items when I'm saying that we're looking for the major items. Uh, not so concerned about, um, you know, little areas that may need a little bit of caulk here and there. All homes are going to need that. And there are no perfect homes. Um, and we may consider, we may discover some things that would be concerning, but that's going to be the case with any house. So let's set the expectations with the buyers. We want them to attend the inspection, most notably the walkthrough, uh, because if they just read the report alone, it can be alarming. Uh, that kind of plays back into that imagination factor. Um, we wanna have the clients visit with the inspector so they can hear and see the deficiencies in person. Um, my company typically goes through the photo journal that they have uh, taken with their cameras and we're pointing out some of the bigger items, particularly some of the areas that they may not have been able to access 
inside the panels up on the roof. We're definitely not taking anybody up there or into the attic. Um, this will give them a good picture of what, how the magnitude, how serious these repairs may be or may not be. Um, taking a few minutes at the start of the inspections, uh, giving them the expectations is what we really like to do because some people come in with notions of us taking a sledgehammer to the walls and knocking them down and opening things up. You know, thank you very much, homes on homes. The guy's not even an inspector, by the way. Uh, but we have to dispel a lot of the myth that's been placed out there by HGTV um, and YouTube. And there's a lot of uh, University of Google degrees as well that we have to uh, work against. So uh, we like to set the expectations at the beginning of the inspection, let them know that we are not magicians and we're not doing aggressive exploratory either. So if the broker or the brokerage or the office thinks that it's appropriate, the agents should attend the inspection also. Believe it or not, there are some brokerages out there that say agents do not go. This is uh, an interaction between the inspector and the client, you know, just work with the client afterwards and see how they feel. I think that it's appropriate for the agent to be involved in this process and they should be able to hear um, how serious some of these repairs uh, would be, some of these deficiencies that we find, because there can be misinterpretations. We've had uh, recommendations at inspections for just a general maintenance on an HVAC system because we happen to see some bio growth on the exterior of the evaporator coil. Well, that just means they maybe haven't been changing the filter enough or they have not had the uh, coils serviced in, in a few years. And so that could be anywhere between a $125 service to a $350 service. But what the buyer came away with when he talked to the agent later in the evening was the inspector said that the HVAC system needs to be replaced. So, of course, that wasn't the case, and that could have easily been handled if the uh, agent was there and they could have heard what we had to say. Now, the difference between reading the report and actually seeing it, okay. There's a term that we use called a double tap breaker. And what it is, is when we have two lines, two conductors that are inappropriately attached to breakers that are not rated for any more than one. So we have a breaker with two conductors coming in, not the way it's supposed to be, what they should have done. Um, obviously this was a homeowner upgrade. They wanted to piggyback on the success or you know just the, the benefit of having some breakers in here rather than installing a couple of new breakers further down in the box where there was space. So something like this, not too dangerous, but it does require correction and probably runs anywhere between $150 to $200 with the materials and the electrician's time. But if there was no photo and no description or no uh, explanation of this and how simple it was, you tell somebody that there's double tap breakers, this is something that goes through their mind right over here. A quagmire of wires hanging out of an open panel with an outlet right here that's just been tapped right into a non-breakered uh, circuit. So having them attend and showing them this photo right here and not just having them read double tap breakers can prevent this running wild imagina imagination uh, scenario right over here. So preparing the buyers after the inspection. Well, we want to help them understand the process. Let me move this out of the way here. Um, that we're gonna put together the report and both them and the realtor will have a chance to review it. We are here to give the facts, not determine who's gonna be responsible for repairs. And in some instances, uh, some of the sellers can be contrary and insulting. Um, we are okay with uh, not talking to sellers, but actually maybe clarifying some of these things. We, we do know that uh, um, sometimes there can be contradictions on what inspectors call out and what the 
sellers may think the condition of their place is. Every seller I, I know seems to think that their house is perfect. There are no need for any repairs. They've been living there for 20 years. They've had birthday parties there, raised kids. They've had many wedding anniversaries and there's absolutely nothing wrong with this house. Well, all that that does is just point to the emotional attachment. We're happy to um, discuss with the agent and the buyers again about what it is that we saw, maybe give them some pointers on how to approach um, the sellers with the verbiage on this and let them know, look, um, we just need to have further evaluation by an HVAC technician, or we wanna have a second opinion from what the inspector said uh, about the foundation with an engineer. So please let us have some time to further review this. So I like this one here. <clears throat> we wanna have expectation of the inspector as well. I'm sorry, I keep having to move around <laughs> uh, the video here. So, Inspectors have the job of educating their clients. They don't just have the job of going in, of uh, throwing out this 60, 70 page report and scaring everybody to death. They need to educate them um, and help them understand the magnitude of the deficiencies. Because when the buyers become nervous, um, a lot of times just some simple education uh, can help relieve their heightened emotions about the situation. And a good inspector is going to keep an eye on those emotions as well. They can tell when people are starting to get uh, nervous, especially those inspectors who, and we know who they are, who uh, have more of an ego problem than anything and want to show everybody what it is that they know. It's usually the no newer inspectors. They're anxious to show that uh, this 2019 home that uh, practically is still brand new, hardly has anything that needs to be done to it does not deserve a 55 or a 60 page report with, you know, 35 actionable items. That's just not the way that it works. And um, so the expectation should be that this inspector should have some common sense. Now, again, it's not the inspector's job to be a contract assassin. We have a lot of hammer slingers. I'm, I'm just going to I'm not throwing my profession under the bus here, but I'm just telling you that uh, I do a lot of training with new inspectors through schools, and there are some guys who are just anxious to get out there and uh, have not had a lot of customer-facing interaction and are a little blunt in their assessment of a house and could tell you that 2019 home is a lemon and you need to run away from it. So keep that in mind when you are assessing or evaluating the inspector that you plan to use for your clients. Is this guy a contract assassin or is he one of these guys who gets it and um, can keep things in perspective? So here's one of those guys. Fred's over here talking with the couple. They show up for the walkthrough. They're all smiles and full of excitement. They got the contract. It's in the place that they want to be. Their kids are going to go to the school that they want them to go to. Her best friend lives down the street. He's got the, 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 uh, the gym right around the corner that he wants to work out at. But this guy shows up and he starts going through his litany of complaints of this house. And then all of a sudden their attitude is taking a, uh, a, a dive south and they're really starting to wonder, oh my gosh, um, is this really the house that we want? This guy seems to think that this place is just falling apart. Well, let, let's be leery of those guys. Um, again, to review, getting the buyers ready for the inspection. Well, have them plan to attend the walkthrough. Walkthrough is best um, because it, it's, it's fine. People want to be there for the entire inspection. Believe me, I've had my share of people walking behind me and asking uh, what it is I'm looking at. But what tends to happen is that can kind of draw things out because we see people like, oh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, can, can I show you something over here? Or, or, or did you see this? Or did you see this little crack over here? Or what do you, why do you think that this paint is different over here? And oh, is this a load bearing wall? That, that's my favorite. Um, so it, having them attend the walkthrough is probably best. Um, if they want to attend the inspection, I will just let them know that uh, I'll be narrating some things, but let's save all the uh, questions for the end. Here's a pencil and notepad. 
go ahead and take some uh, notes and I guarantee you that I'm gonna address probably 95% of what it is that you write down uh, at the walkthrough. Furthermore, we wanna remind them they're not on television, they're not Chip and Joanna Gaines and that they should not be throwing out repair estimates from the hip uh, themselves. They need to have those bids and repair estimates coming from professionals. I see a lot of couples come in, start you know, hand on their chin, looking around at the bathroom going, yeah, we can do this for about $2,500. I was like, really? This bathroom was like 350 square feet and you think you're gonna, no, 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 no. You need to have somebody come in here and give you a realistic expectation because you're probably looking somewhere between 25 and 40 grand for a full on remodel in this, this bathroom here. Uh, the inspectors are not on TV either. We would love to go in there with reciprocating saws and sledgehammers and do all sorts of aggressive exploratory, but that would not go over well with the sellers. So um, we remind them that it's non-invasive. It's mostly visual, not technically exhaustive. We're not gonna be disassembling the house or the components with, uh, there within. <clears throat> all houses are gonna have deficiencies, even new construction. Above all, we want to read the report. Have them read the report. I'm gonna say it one more time. Have them read the entire report. Most of the claims that inspectors get stem from the clients not looking at the report. Um, I can point to one where it was most recent, the guy back in, May, when we had all that rain, uh, the buyer, the gentleman called me up and said, hey, um, I've got water coming in through the bath vent in the master bath. Uh, the roof seems to have a leak. I said, yeah, I, okay, that, man, that would be unnerving for me as well. Tell you what, let me look at the report when I uh, get back to the office and I'll give you a call right back as, as soon as I do. And I looked at the report and I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm looking here. Joe, um, in the uh, attic photos, and I can actually see that there was an active leak um, at the vent itself. And on the top of the roof side, we can see that that vent had actually been lifted uh, by some winds and it was detached. Obviously, a one and a half inch gap right there is going to allow some sort of some water to penetrate. And I did recommend that you have a roofer come out and perform the repairs. Uh, did you do that? And he goes, well, no, I, I you know, actually, when you mentioned that uh, at the walkthrough, um, we just kind of decided that, you know, that was probably going to be $250 to repair. So we took money in lieu of the repairs. It's like, okay, well, I, I understand that. So did you get it repaired? Well, no. It's like, okay, well, I I okay, I hope that I was able to clarify everything here, but this is not anything that I can help you out with. I can give you the number of a roofer if you like. So had he actually followed through on the repairs, I'm sorry, the repair recommendations in the report, we probably would not have been having that conversation. Now, again, we're not uh, fortune tellers. We're not going to give uh, estimates on future functionality or when things are going to die. We do get lots of questions about, well, how old is this unit? Well, it's this HVAC unit is 19 years old. Well, should it be replaced? It's like, well, you know, our standards of practice dictate, we tell you whether it's functioning or not. I can tell you the age here and the manufacturer's life expectancy is that it's probably beyond its life expectancy, then every day is a gift. And you may want to budget for the replacement if, you know, in its imminent failure, uh, but it's functioning right now. Um, now, every home is gonna have defects or areas that need improvement. Sellers are almost always gonna fix the things that don't work. The, if there's a, a plumbing leak, or if there's a clog in a drain, or if there's an HVAC system that's not working, or if there's an active roof leak, those are easy ones. Um, try and avoid go entering into negotiations about things that are not black and white um, or things that um, you know they think are gonna fail in the future or things that um, maybe are code then versus now features or what people call grandfathered in. Um, some 
electrical features would fall into that range. I like to remind clients that when they're looking at an older house, we want to approach it with the aspect of it possibly being, I like this analogy, that they're looking at a 1957 Chevy. How does it drive? Not does it have airbags and disc brakes? Obviously, they're not going to get those. In that same vein, sellers are not going to install GFCI outlets or AFCI breakers or you know, other grounding that may have come into play since the house was built, they're going to fix the big items. So repairing, preparing the response for the sellers. Well, the reports that we print out um, are pretty realtor friendly in that we have action items, red items right here. These are items that require some sort of action, some sort of negotiation or repair uh, within that option period. Consideration items, so oh, these could be like, you know, reminders about keeping the exterior windows caulked, some maintenance items, you know, things that you wanna do for winterization or um, things to do during the summer. Uh, these items up here, well, we have a, a leak at the waste pipe and there's some exposed wiring. The fireplace did not work. We've got uh, problems in the bathrooms as well. So these are actionable items. These are not as important right here. These are things that they can just consider the honeydew list after the ball game is over on Sunday. So what we recommend is taking the highlighter and going through and highlighting the things that are concerning to the buyer. Well, drain, drain leak, fireplace doesn't work, master bath, sink faucet uh, doesn't turn off, left sink drains slowly, probably a clog, and the master bathroom jet tub is not functioning. Those are things that they consider, you know, important to them. Well, concerning. Things that are important, well, let's redline those. Well, I really don't want to have to do any plumbing work here on that leak. Uh, I don't know anything about fireplaces. Let's have them fix that. Um, the, uh, the sink, I don't want to have to disassemble that. You know, the clog here, I can probably, it's probably just hair. I can put some Drano down there, or stick a snake down there and pull the stuff out. Uh, the jet tub, again, I don't want to have to disassemble that. So let's consider that concerning and important. Then what do we consider things that are really important? Okay, we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. We whittled down quite a few comments here to a smaller set of, well, let's have them fix the fireplace, the master bathroom sink. I don't wanna to have to disassemble and rebuild that thing or replace it. And the master bath, the same, I'm not gonna disassemble that jet tub. It could be a, uh, um, a pump that needs replacing and I don't wanna even, speculate on how much that is going to be. Let's ask them to do that. So these three three things right there um, are what would go into your repair request or the repair addendum. So that process can take uh, a list of some things that um, can be a little uh, unnerving at first, uh, but you know, going through them a few times, you can see that you only have out of like seven or eight, you have one, two, three items that you are going to ask to be repaired. So I'd like to say it's almost as easy as that. Um, everybody's just really super easy to work with and nobody's nervous and everybody's calm, right? So be sure to involve the inspector, especially when things start getting a little gray. Uh, we are supposed to be a walking bank of accurate knowledge. You should be able to give us a call uh, and have us engage with the client when they start getting cold feet. It can help put things back into perspective. Um, this also can help with dealing with the emotions. We can give them non-emotional information, accurate, make them decide for themselves whether the house is right for them. Uh, it's rare that people, you know, back out of deals, but it does happen. And hopefully it's not uh, from an incendiary verbiage minded uh, inspector. Sometimes the houses do fail themselves. I mean, we've seen houses where it's like, oh my gosh, 
I, I know I, I joke about inspectors putting out 60, 70 page reports, but my gosh, I, I just, you know, I typically do like 23, 25 page reports and this one was almost 50. I don't know if they're gonna go through with this one here. So sometimes the house does fail itself and it just has too much of a laundry list, but we still are okay with, and should be okay as inspectors talking with the clients and letting them know, well, oh, this is a big deal. This is not a big deal. Hey, this is an X factor right here. You really need to get, we need to stop uh, bouncing this one back and forth between us. And you just need to get a contractor out there to take a look at that and see what the real repair cost is and how serious it is uh, a, a, a hit to your budget. Um, so we're there for good advice and we should always be responsive. Inspectors who are not uh, typically are the guys that you want to avoid. So furthering on the inspector here, well, the experience and the training matters. Um, guys who have lots of training, have mentors, you definitely want to be using those guys, uh, as opposed to the guy who just got out of school, has that really high inspector number and is taking it out on his own. I'm going to tell you right now, all that inspectors have to do is train for 40 hours out in the field with somebody like myself, uh, go take the test after they've completed their schooling, and then they are free to go out in the wild and drive everybody crazy. Um, our new inspectors get anywhere between, oh, uh, geez, I don't know how about the hours, but uh, I've got a couple of them on the, uh, the call right here that are probably going to shake their heads when I say, I don't let them go till I'm, I'm comfortable. And that can take you anywhere between 25 to 50 or 60 practice inspections. And then beyond that, um, I'm still reviewing their reports up until I feel that they're comfortable and um, getting everything accurate and right and uh, not driving everybody crazy. So um, the experience does matter. Um, beware of those inspectors with those really high license numbers that are on their own. The, ins the information has to be accurate. We don't want it to be speculative or, you know, them kind of thinking what they uh, feel is important. They should be sticking to the standards of practice. One example that I had last week, I had an agent send me a report asking if I could review it. And I said, well, tough for me to review somebody else's report, but you know, what are some of the big items? He says, well, you know, first of all, here's why I'm ha having you take a look at it. Do you think that bird poop on the roof should be called out as a deficiency? I said, oh, okay, send me that report. I, I gotta see this. Um, and of course it was 72 pages. Now, um, let me see here, yeah, okay. So choosing an inspection company, Make sure they have good communication skills. Make sure that they um, have had some customer facing experience and uh, can actually talk to people. They need to be responsive to the client's needs. They need to be available for inspections with extended hours, nights and weekends. Not everybody can make nine and 12 o'clock inspections during the week. Some people uh, need the weekends or after hours. The scheduling process should be easy. Um, when we are on a roof or in an attic, it's kind of tough for us. So I can forward people to either my online scheduling or my office. I'll have my office call them and they will schedule and arrange the uh, inspection and also access into the property. Uh, and that being said, everybody, every inspector should have an e-key. If you have an inspector who is asking for you to be at the inspection to let them in, eh, I'll just leave that one hanging out there. So they need to be there before, during, and after the inspection with advice. Now, um, we don't like to just turn and burn these inspections. A lot of clients have questions beforehand. They want to convey those concerns before I show up to the inspection. Uh, they have questions during the inspection and they have questions after. They want some advice on what it is that we put into the, um, the report or how to deal with a 
or what to be looking for with uh, in in way of a uh, a contractor or an engineer or an HVAC company. Um, e and O insurance. I, I would typically ask everybody if they know right now what the minimum amount of liability in E and O insurance is for an inspector here in Texas. Uh, you would be surprised. It's only a hundred thousand dollars, and with the uh, home values ever increasing here in Austin and Texas for that matter. I don't know that $100,000 would cover a whole lot if there was a catastrophic miss in an inspection by an inspector who was on his own. Um, so $100,000 aggregate and incident. Our company has $10 million, by the way. Uh, the report needs to be easily read, has to be delivered in a timely manner. Again, this is a, a TREK standard. Um, they say timely manner. That was kind of broadly interpreted for the longest time. Then they kind of defined it. It was 72 hours. Now I think it's down to 48 hours. We get hours out within 12 hours, same day. We don't know a lot of people that can wait 72 or 48 hours for a report, especially with three and five day option periods with an inspection that got scheduled on, uh, you know, day two or three. So we want to be cognizant of that fact, that, uh, that factor, and definitely help our realtors and clients out by getting a report delivered to them as soon as possible. Now, that kind of goes into the next one here, poor client service. That can be an irritation it will definitely heighten the emotions and um, can sour the deal, make it really difficult for the agent. So be aware of inspectors that do that on a routine basis. Bilingual. We do have a couple of inspectors here in Austin that speak Spanish and also English and can take on uh, people that are in need of those services. So please keep that in mind. Now, finally, remember at the beginning of the presentation here, I said, you guys are the cheerleaders. We want to keep everything positive. Um, buying the home is always, all, almost always the best decision. Uh, part of keeping it positive is choosing the right vendors, the right inspector. You like to have uh, HVAC technicians that you trust, a roofer that you trust that can get out there uh, in short order and give you a, an honest bid on repairs, not one of these inflated bids. You want inspectors that can have a good relationship and communicate well with your client, not give these incendiary 70-page reports. You want them cutting to the chase and giving everybody just the, uh, the facts. They're going to spend their lives in those, those homes. Um, well, not their entire lives, but they're definitely going to be in there for a lot of the important events. So um, we want to keep them focused on the, that prize there and don't have them lose sight over it over a, a few small items, especially when in the grand scope of things, if they're looking at anywhere between you know, $1,000 to $5,000 repairs that they take on on their own and they're spending $702,000 on the house. Well, that's a, a small uh, amount in, uh, in relation to that. So um, that is the end of the pr presentation. I am going to stop the share on this one here and ask if you have any questions to go ahead and unmute yourself. I think I see that uh, just about everybody's been unmute or everybody's muted. So if you do have a question, you wanted to talk with me or have one of my lovely inspectors here, uh, Mike or Will um, answer and be happy to uh, do so at this time. So fire away, please. I know you have questions. Don't be shy. I won't bite. Anyone? I find that hard to believe. You did a good presentation. Any... I'm sorry? You did a good presentation, I guess. Oh, well, you know, great. Um, a little bit more about uh, our company. We are seven day a week 
inspectors. We have evening inspections, early morning. We offer a variety of services, not just inspections. We do home inspections, commercial. Um, we do termite, pool, sprinklers, uh, septic, well. Um, the well, we actually use an in-town laboratory for our sampling and uh, we do E. coli and total coliform. Um, we also have a great service, which is sewer line scans, where we have um, a licensed individual who can not just do the sewer lateral between the house and the street, but he actually does under the house, from the back of the house. If he has to, he'll go up through the roof uh, if there are no proper accesses for the plumbing. And he does high def camera scans of those plumbing systems, the drainage systems, and you, the client, gets a high def video of that, um, of that scan as well. And he can uncover whether or not there's actually clogs or if there's breaks in the line or if there's cast iron piping, whether or not it needs to be replaced, repaired, or sleeved. Um, he can also, I've had him come out a couple of times where um, I did call out some clogs and deficiencies on the drain system and plumbers have come out and within five minutes had produced a $13,000 repair estimate. And they, the client and the agent called me up and said, Is this, does this sound right? So mm, I don't think so. The bill there doesn't fit what I described. Tell you what, hire this guy right here. Um, we schedule him through our company and it's $225. He'll be out there for about an hour, hour and a half, scanning the inside of the lines there. Uh, and he will uh, give you an honest answer. Of course, he gets out there and in one house, um, the repair was, Repair was needed, but it was in the $1,500 range. The other house that he did uh, was vacant and somebody had shoved towels down the drain. So it was just a matter of having those yanked out. That was a $300 repair. And that was actually the, uh, the house that had the $13,000 bid on it. So um, $300 is definitely much cheaper than $13,000. Um, anyone? Please feel free to uh, speak up. Um, I have, go ahead. I have two questions. So you keep talking about the walkthrough. Is that just at the end or is that something separate? I'm That's sorry? At the, at the end of the inspection. Okay. If we're starting at uh, nine o'clock for me, uh, for example, if I was going to be doing a 15, 1700 square foot home that is, oh, you know, 20 years old, probably going to take me about, you know, maybe an hour and a half. I would uh, start at nine. I would ask them to show up sometime around 10, 15, 10, 30, let them familiarize themselves with the house, maybe take some measurements, measure the drapes, you know, uh, where the TV and the couch is going to go and such. And then uh, that would give me time to finish up, bring the photos from my camera over onto my laptop, show them some of the bigger items, walk them out to some of the items that I want to show them uh, inside or outside the house. So that is at the end of the inspection, yes. Okay, and what do your inspections run like as far as pricing, just to kind of know, to give an uh, idea? It, of it's all based yeah. on square footage, um, okay. 295 up to 1,000 square feet, and then we go by 500 square foot increments after that, anywhere between you know, 25 to $35 per, you know, 500. So um, a little bit of a moving target because there okay. are factors to, to take into account if the house is older than 40 years old, there's a little bit of an upcharge. Um, pier and beam is going to be a little bit more. Do they have other features uh, there that they need to have looked at as well? Um, another thing that I forgot to mention, um, we do have inspectors that have foundation levels that we'll use on houses that we suspect have issues. And we also do thermal imaging. Okay. 
Yeah, so, I, I liked the report that you showed me because I've gotten back two reports back to back and all it said was deficient on almost every item. And I was like, oh my gosh. That, my that can be, and, and the reason I like to point out uh, or use one of our key finding reports as an example is because I get it that I've used many, many uh, software suites for reporting, uh, writing inspection reports. And when you get... 37 deficiencies, you don't know which ones are the important ones. Mm -hmm. And typically those inspectors who have those type of reports, you ask them after staying up till two in the morning and copying and pasting these into your own document. It's like, hey, fella, give me your top 10 out of this. I, I really don't know what to do with this. Mm -hmm. How important is this? How dangerous is this? How uh, how much, you know, which ones cost the most, which ones are the most important. And of course they don't get back to you for like another 24 or 48 hours. That's not very helpful. No. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Who else? Somebody else was about to ask. Christy, did you have something? Yeah. Mine's more about foundation issues, um, sure. especially when you're showing buyers homes. What are we supposed to be looking for? A lot of them are disclosing that they already know the foundation issues are there, but I'm just wondering, like, what are the major things? I looked at one home and the brick and everything was moving over. So like, what do I need to know as a real estate agent? I don't want to give them any information, but what should I be looking for? That's probably most of what you need to know, you know, is just kind of point to the seller's disclosure at right. that point. And if they want to have, um, you know, further evaluation, you know, the inspector is going to take a look at that. You as the realtor, um, if you're looking at it, um, the, the bigger items when you're walking around the exterior of the house, brick is not necessarily going to indicate or be the prime indicator of foundation movement. It would be one of the indicators that we take into account. Looking at a foundation that has cracks that either extend upwards in a, uh, an expanding fashion or maybe the other way, an expanding uh, down towards the base of the foundation could mean that it's either you're having some upheaval or it's having some fall in the middle there. So large cracks on the exterior of the foundation itself are more indicative of some movement rather than the brick uh, because the foundations in Texas, they are slab on grade. They have a lot of rebar inside of them. They have rebar cords or cables that actually are put that have tension on them that hold these foundations together. So as they move, they still stay together and not always need repair. Um, so if you see some brick moving, it could be just from the foundation, you know, moving a little bit and that transference of that movement uh, may be a little unnerving, but it's kind of more dependent on what the interior elevations are. You know, what is the actual uh, fall or rise over distance and um, avoid being concerned about cracks on the corners of the foundations. Those are almost always from the brick expanding when it gets cold at night here and then it heats up in the morning. Um, there's two different masonry products that you're looking at and you're, you're trying to compare uh, for movement. And what I mean by that is the brick and the concrete will get cold overnight and get a cold snap. The next morning, sun comes out and shines on that corner. What happens is the brick expands faster than that Portland cement, which is the concrete foundation. So you have the foundation expanding a little bit, but the brick expanding even faster. So what happens is it pushes off the corner of that foundation. Now, a lot of people see these big cracks on the corners and go, oh my gosh. And we just, as inspectors, we look at it and we're kind of like, yeah. <laughs> you see that on 99% of the homes here in, in Austin or in Texas for that matter that have um, brick on them. And sometimes even like uh, brick and stone and occasionally uh, stucco. So I, I hope that that helps. There is a, a foundation <laughs> company that- yeah, That was look. helpful. That was helpful. Yeah, just sure. I, it's when they don't disclose it, it and you know, you're walking through the home and you can kind of feel the, right. the incline. Like or a the, fun house. 
yeah. So just, just yeah. wanted to know what to look for. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Anyone else? All right. Well, I, I was just going to jump in. Good morning, everyone. Randall, thank you very much. And thank you for all the participants. This um, Zoom presentation has been recorded and it will be available for all of our agents on the Agent Hub, as well as our, our YouTube training channel. So thank you very much. Absolutely. I was happy to help. Nice to meet everyone. I think with that, we'll go ahead and uh, end the call. Yes. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, Randall.